to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 555. My name is Camden Busey. I serve as the pastor of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Grays Lake, Illinois. We're back with another great episode for you today. Let me introduce to you the guys I have with me online. First, we have with us Jim Cassidy, who serves as the pastor of South Austin OPC in South Austin, Texas. Welcome back, Jim. It's great to see you today. As always, good to be here, Camden. I say C because I'm watching Jim on Skype this time. We're, we're playing with some of the new video equipment as we have the last couple episodes, but uh, Jim's in his study there in South Austin, Texas. It's good to speak with you again, brother. We've got a great episode lined up today, namely because our guest is none other than Dr. Daryl G. Hart. He's a Distinguished Associate Professor of History at Hillsdale College. Welcome back, Daryl. It's great to speak with you, too. Thanks, Camden. Good to be with you. Yeah, Hello, we've, Jim. we've uh, spoken with Daryl a number of times uh, through the years on, on Christ the Center. It's always a joy to have you on, Daryl. Uh, but today we get to speak about the latest and one that's definitely of great interest to our listeners and uh, to me, even personally. And that is uh, this wonderful book, uh, Still Protesting. Uh, why the Reformation Matters. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, is it available yet? I didn't even see the release date. If it's not, it's coming out uh, next month, I believe, uh, from well, Reformation Heritage at, Books. Yeah, at, at the publisher, Amazon, I think, still does not have it. But oh, strange. I know some people have gotten it straight from the publisher. So. Well, that's great. It must just be maybe a warehouse thing, but it's uh, it's out there. It's it's If it's not, if you can't find it where you prefer, I'm sure you'll be able, the listener will be able to find it very soon. And, uh, you know, RHB does a lot of great work. And so we're glad to see this book out with them now. Uh, we got a few things to mention before we dive down into the book and talk about this important issue of the Reformation and speaking also about how Reformed theology is so needed today, especially as Protestants and Catholics still relate. We still need the Reformation. It's not uh, something that is passe or something that is insignificant or from a bygone era, but rather something that persists, an important subject, no doubt. But first, we got a few pieces uh, of news, and we want to announce, of course, and get people to visit over at our website at reformedforum.org to learn more about our upcoming events. We have two main events coming up. Uh, We have the, the annual Theology Conference, October 5th, 6th, and 7th here in Grays Lake in uh, 2018. That's just coming up in a couple months. Early bird registration is still in effect, but only for the end of this month. So uh, come August 31st, that early bird rate's going to go away. And we last I checked, just a couple days ago, we still have a ticket, maybe two, uh, for the VIP dinner where Danny Olinger will be lecturing on on Voss and Thomas and uh, and how Voss uh, is in, very significant for our understanding of the what Voss calls the deeper Protestant conception. It's going to be a very special event, so there's still a couple of tickets available for that. Check them out and then come to the, the conference where we're going to talk about that deeper Protestant conception. If you're not free then or if you want to double up, come to and visit us April, uh, the first week of April, 1st through 6th. Uh, Lane Tipton will be teaching a class down in Wimberley, Texas. It's a very special event, the unique occasion where he will be lecturing and uh, speaking about foundations of covenant theology. It's going to be the first, we hope, in a three-course series, and um, we're going to be have this scheduled and, and uh, structured as an adult Sunday school class where people can come and, and uh, watch the lectures and participate in them. We'll have a video crew there to film them. And then we'll we'll put them out as a as a series for churches to use as Sunday schools and for individuals to use just for continuing education. Uh, so there'll be plenty of time for you to you know bring your wife or your husband down and and spend time together having a week off. Uh, but if you'd like to uh, talk theology night and day, there are a handful of you out there that we know we know that like to do that. We also are going to have a few guest houses on location. Uh, where you can rent those out. So keep your eyes open at the website for more information about that as soon as registration opens very soon. All this is online at reformedforum.org. All right. Well, Daryl, just before speaking, we uh, talked about uh, this time of year. We know things are going to be spinning back up for you at Hillsdale College. And uh, we also know that, well, maybe people don't know, but Hillsdale's in the great state of Michigan. 
and uh, this time of year is very exciting for for the football fans as things are are spinning up. But uh, why don't you give people just a brief update about what you've been up to and maybe some of the fun classes you teach at Hillsdale College and. I don't know. I'll give you an opportunity to plug the to plug the school because we know it's a great place for folks. Well, it also bears on the book, but um, no, I've been teaching here now seven years. I teach um, in the history department, and everyone in history teaches Western heritage in the fall and American heritage in the spring, and um, these are part of the core curriculum, which is fairly large. It takes students generally about two years to get through it, but they do receive a uh, a good liberal arts education, borderline great books uh, like, but it's it's not quite that because it has to encompass a lot of, a lot of the disciplines. Mm-hmm. And then I teach upper level courses uh, in the spring. I just taught intellectual history. This semester I'm teaching religion in the U.S. and uh, a course on Jewish American life. Um, there's a lot of freedom to teach uh, any number of things. And I keep telling my wife, um, I just have learned so much, uh, because I've had to prepare for a number of things, but just anyway, it's very, it's sure. just been a great environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted and I hope the chargers do well on, on the gridiron <laughs> this year. <laughs> Well, I, I do as well, although uh, regular listeners know uh, my heart cheers for the Wolverines along with your cohort, uh, John right. Mather. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to, or at least we're optimistic as of yet. Things aren't going so well uh, for the school to the south, uh, but we'll see. Uh, opening day is going to be against uh, the Fighting Irish, Notre Dame. So we always hope that we have a good, yep, they're renewing the rivalry, but we always hope that we have a a good showing against the Papists. And uh, that that also touches upon the the subject matter of the book today. I don't think, you don't have any chapters on on football per se, but uh, no doubt uh, there's definitely a lot in here that has to do with our our observance. And we know you've written much in the past on your websites about about, uh, the American fascination with football on the Lord's Day. Um, that's maybe a subject matter for another discussion, but let's talk about Meether for a second. We see he wrote the forward here. Uh, you two have been a, a tandem for a long time. And both are tremendous writers. I'll read anything you write uh, in print. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to have this book, but um, I really appreciated uh, his forward. And uh, what's some of the history there? And Well, I mean, John and I have, we, we, taught Sunday school classes in our respective congregations <clears throat> about this. We've, um, we wrote a series actually for the outlook, um, on this. And we were trying to build up a book project that, uh, would culminate in this. And somewhere along the line, John decided he just didn't know as much as he felt he needed to. And I've kept at this in part because, um, I, uh, I've worked with and around Roman Catholics now sure. for 15 years, both at ISI Intercollegiate Studies Institute, where I worked before coming to Hillsdale, and a lot of good friends in both places um, and colleagues are, are serious Roman Catholics, so, and a number of them converted from Protestant backgrounds, some evangelical, some mainline, and so I've been having to think, why is this happening? And also, why does Rome have no appeal to me? And also, another factor in this is is Hillsdale, um, the way the curriculum sets up, I think, in some ways, and other factors, we have a lot of students here convert to Rome. Mm. Um, And so it's it's a kind of, it's it's an odd environment in that way, because everywhere else in the world, pretty much people are disaffected from Roman Catholicism in part because of the scandals, but also in part for other reasons. And, and yet here, um, students, I think, read a lot in the medieval world. They read, uh, Roman Catholic novelists, some theology, and, and I think they have a, um, a, a fairly rosy view of what Roman Catholicism is thanks to those texts and authors and, I don't know how much they really know about um, actual church history and, and the politics of the church, and even about the um, the significant di- uh, issues of the of the 16th century. Yeah, this has definitely been on my mind too. I mean, 
I think most most of us and many of our listeners, no doubt, if they didn't grow up Catholic, they at least had a Catholic neighbor, if not a family member. Uh, I, I would imagine that that would be the case. Um, but there, we should recognize just how large the Catholic Church is, and at least on their books. Uh, last I checked a couple of years ago, there were 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. And uh, that kind of was eye-opening to me. And I did my, my PhD work on a, on a very influential Catholic theologian named Karl Rahner. And uh, he was an influential figure, um, you know, at the Vatican, Second Vatican Council. And so learning much more about Catholicism today is important uh, and I think you, we have these caricatures, especially within the, the Reformed world. Do you agree, Daryl, that there are often these caricatures of Catholicism? But not only are they caricatures, but they're even often 500-year-old caricatures. So they're definitely <laughs> not, not accurate today, but they might not have even been accurate 500 years ago. Right. Um, I, think, I think that is fair, although I, I do, I think the book... Uh, relies on the differences of the 16th century uh, maybe more than it you know some might think it should because the church has Roman Catholics would say developed uh, sure. others would say change change is a dirty word for Roman Catholics even what Pope Francis did recently depends with, on the Catholic uh, in, <laughs> right but with the death penalty and, and right, the change right. he made, to the catechism, people mm-hmm. are trying to explain that such that it's not really a change. Um, and, you know, so in many respects, what's what's been surprising to me, and this is, um, this is where the apologists for Roman Catholicism, it seems to me, really do give a caricature of the Church, which is how, how many moving parts there are in the Roman Catholic Church and how many, how much it's a moving target. It's really hard in some ways to figure out what Roman Catholicism is. You would think, with all of the writing, all the history, all the centrality of the of the Vatican, even as lengthy a document as the Catechism of the Church is, and by the way, that would be a really difficult manual to teach to children. It makes the Westminster Shorter Catechism <laughs> look like a walk in the park. But, um, but with for all of that, it also means that with two thousand years of history. And so many different kinds of papal uh, instruction, and there's a difference between an apostolic exhortation and an encyclical, and you can go online to find out the ver- the status and, and power of each of these documents. But when you, if you simply have that much writing, and you know, the analogy would be scripture itself, which you could argue runs from roughly uh maybe you know depending on how you date certain books maybe a 600 year period you know maybe a thousand year period if you want to get really sloppy or something i don't but mm-hmm. you know you have writings over that much time um it's go, there are going to be differences in, and of course people in trying to figure out the meaning of the bible have to square paul saying that circumcision no longer matters with abraham and what god told abraham about uh, you know, circumcision. So, I mean, there's there's that kind of difference even in Scripture itself, but to try to then work that out, not just for the Bible and the Apocrypha, which are part of the canon for Roman Catholics, but then all of the councils, all the papal teachings, all of canon law, and all the the revisions that go with it, it it's, it's really difficult to find coherence in all of that, and in some ways it does make the papacy all the more important, because it'd be very hard for anyone to wrap their minds around all that. So you can at least say, okay, the Pope is the center and, and that one is going to be the one who kind of guides us through all this. Um, but it's, it's, and so, you know, that is in some ways, isn't the way that Protestants who don't spend much time with Roman Catholicism don't think about the church that way, that it really is a much bigger animal pardon that word, then um, it may look mm-hmm. in certain cliched versions of sure. the church. Right. You know, for the listener who doesn't have a copy of the book yet, um, Daryl, as you write in the preface, uh, this book addresses at least one side of the debate that is divided Protestants and Roman Catholics. So we're looking from a, a Protestant perspective. 
Um, but it's helpful to realize that, that Catholics, as you mentioned, sometimes don't always have a, an accurate assessment of themselves as a church body. And so it's helpful to, to get this vantage point here in this book. But as you've alluded to, even in, this, in our conversation today, that this book emerges particularly from the context of an increasing number of Protestants who convert to Roman Catholicism. And so your aim, as you write, is, is to address some of the most frequent reasons given for abandoning Protestantism. But what I, what I found in reading this book, but also in interacting with Catholics, is that um, you know, Catholicism typically isn't what, what people think that it is, uh, or they think they're, they're buying something, but what they find out they receive is, is quite different. And uh, we'll get into that with the different chapters uh, upon worship, also speaking particularly about church authority and the government. Uh, there are these understandings, and often superficial and simplistic understandings of the Catholic Church, uh, that that um, people are attracted to. But when they get in there, they they realize that uh, some of it, at least, uh, can be become a house of cards. Right. It's but it, it's it's also though surprising for me, at least at my age, when um, I can remember back when Anglicanism lo- looked like the the attractive uh, communion to evangelicals. Um, Robert Weber, professor at Wheaton, 60s, 70s, 80s, wrote a book on uh, something on the Canterbury Trail or whatever it was. And, you know, someone needs, if any of your listeners are PhD students, somebody needs to do a dissertation on all of the Anglican parishes that Wheaton College has has uh, nurtured. Um, they're like diff- six different ones. They've split. They've gone into different communions and whatnot. But really, that was that was the way to be a high church Protestant back in the eighties was to go Anglican, and for some reason that really lost its appeal. Uh, I think in part because of the waffling on sex and family life uh, that happened there. And I do think that that is a big part of the appeal, which is that Rome seems to be uh, consistent on um, yeah. sex mm. and, 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 and that kind of morality, although with the scandals you know, mm-hmm. that keep coming down the road, yes, on paper they are, but how much of that holiness really seeps down into the lives of even you know the, the some people with the highest authority in the church anyway yeah and yeah. i I, th- I don't i really don't want to go down that road much because i do think it's an easy shot to sort of look at the scandals in the church and say and condemn the church for that reason and i think you know these kinds of um well and a lot of sexual... protestants might live in glass houses right exactly I think you Al Mohler made that comment kind of, with the Southeastern Baptist stuff uh, with Mr. Patterson that happened recently, and he came out on his right. program. Although and he said he was not, he was not nearly. <laughs> oh no! What oh, I read, no, no! 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 He was not nearly as involved with this stuff. It's a question, in some ways, of covering up for these yeah. people too. Uh, but, um, but you know, so I, I do think. I, I do think you can raise questions, though, not about the priests themselves or bishops or cardinals who may have engaged in abhorrent behavior, but the people then who covered up, what kind of discernment right. and what kind of power do those people have for that kind of discernment? And that's the same kind of discernment, it seems to me, on which the Church relies when it comes to its teaching aspects as well. It's not as if somehow morality is different from theology when it comes to discerning the truth of these things. And, and and that is, it seems to me, a major issue for uh, the nature of the episcopacy and apostolic succession and what Roman Catholics believe about that. Um, if you can get it wrong about uh, how to handle a scandal in a, in a diocese, why do you think they wouldn't get it wrong when it comes to figuring out the true nature of the Trinity or something? I, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I don't, it's not obvious to me that that's an easy distinction to make. Yeah, I want to get Jim's thoughts in here to set the stage uh, for the rest of our conversation because I think I'd like to connect the book also just to day-to-day life in the church. 
Uh, this, these aren't abstract questions. This isn't just a, 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 the kind of thing that, you know, academics debate on the relationship between Protestantism and, and Catholicism. But Jim, what's, what's been your experience with Catholicism through the years? But I'm particularly interested now just with your church plant and uh, where, where is the interface? Where, where's the meeting point? Do you have congregants that are coming from Catholic churches? Do you have some that have left for them? Do you have ex-Catholics? What does it look like in South Austin? Well, uh, as you know, Camden, I'm, I'm an ex-Catholic myself and, um, you know, was raised in Rome, uh, well, not in the city, uh, but in, in Roman Catholicism. And um, that was the uh, my, my upbringing. And a lot of people kind of wonder, you know, did you leave Rome because of what we heard about we have heard about these scandals and i think daryl is absolutely right uh daryl you're right i mean it's a kind of a cheap shot i guess to, to point to that it's kind of an easy easy target um and and say ah oh, look you know and and meanwhile of course we we have our own sin and, and our own churches have our own sin and um we're you know certainly um that's the case and and so we don't want to uh be trying to take specs out of other people's eyes at this point, but it really does uh, fall to the matter of theology. And, uh, and and I remember at one point when I really, when I began to realize the doctrine of justification by faith, alone, I'll never forget, I was uh, taking a break in college, it was during summer break, and I was reading Galatians, and uh, I was still a new Christian, and still kind of figuring out where I would end up and wind up, and just reading Galatians and reading about Paul's doctrine of justification by faith alone. Um, and, and Paul has, has that statement, uh, all those who rely on the works of the law are, are condemned. And, uh, and, and it struck me that all my life growing up, I had been taught to rely on the works of the law. And mm. so, uh, when the doctrine of justification, um, kind of hit home, I realized, wow, I said, this is, this is more than just kind of like you know, trite reasons to leave Rome, like, oh, you got all this kind of, you know, uh, fakeness, you got all this uh, kind of ritualism, there's no personal relationship, which were my initial early Christian protests against um, Rome. Uh, When I began to understand, though, the theology, and then began to understand the Reformation, and began to understand why Luther and why the Protestant Reformation and the doctrine of justification all kind of came together. And I, I, I did go through a period of time where I was quite upset with Rome, thinking, wow, I mean, I was just being fed falsehoods um, as I was growing up and, um, and given a false impression. I was never taught the gospel. I was never taught the good news. And, um, and that really upset me for a while. And that's what we deal with, to come around to your question, Camden, in the church, in ministry. Uh, we, we have people who are who are Catholics or former Catholics, and they come to our church and they ask questions and 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 they and they don't have any assurance of salvation and they don't know the gospel and this is a great opportunity for us uh, not to beat up on Rome and to take it as an opportunity to kind of hack and slash at at the church and take cheap shots at it, but it's an opportunity really for us to sit down and say, look at these glorious truths. You let me know. Have you have have you been taught this before? Open up the scriptures. Open up Galatians. Talk about talk about justification by faith alone and and um, sola gratia and and the great doctrines that came out of the Reformation and mm-hmm. and begin to minister those things to to God's uh, to people's hearts and mm-hmm. and let let the Lord bear the fruit from that. So, Daryl, you know. What is your hope, not only with this book, but as we as we read the book and come out of it? What is your hope for for the, the Protestant Church? I mean, is there do we need a renewed vigor in the in the fight against Rome? Do we need another Reformation? Do we need to be reminded of why the Reformation happened in the first place? Is it all of the above? Right. Um, I guess my hope for Protestants is to be a. I guess to remember. What we're that we that we were are a protesting uh, people, and what we're so to remind what we are what we protested originally, and whether we still protest. So in that sense, uh, it could help us be better Protestants, not just because we are, we're a, a disagreeable lot, but I mean I think I've actually come to understand Scripture and uh, teachings of of the Church. Um, 
Reformed communion much better. I think I'm a better Christian for having studied Roman Catholicism and and recognizing that that just isn't what Scripture teaches. Um, I mean, I I, I think um, you know. So oh, before I go there, so I think it, it's sort of a, a hope for renewal, but it's also a hope for Protestants who may know people who are tempted to become Roman Catholic or people who are walking uh, close to that side, at least to be aware of some of the arguments that a lot of apologists use. Um, But uh, I I mean, I do think I I want to try to be as charitable as possible. And again, I would emphasize that I have had uh, great collegiality, great friendship with Roman Catholic colleagues uh, the last two jobs. And I hold these people in great respect. Um, and, and so I, I hope I'm not coming across as some kind of uh, bigot. Um, no. but, but on the other hand, um, the, um, it's just hard for me to believe all that Rome teaches. And, and I mean, I think it really helps us to see how simple in some ways the gospel is how simple the Protestant faith is compared to how cluttered the Roman Catholic Church is. I mean, I think someone can be a true believer and be a member of the Roman Catholic Church. I don't mm-hmm. think that's advisable, but I do think it is possible. I think it's possible to hear the good news of the gospel, to receive some kind of care from Roman Catholics. So it's not completely unchristian, to say the way Machen described. Uh, Protestant liberalism. But on the other hand, I just think there's so much other stuff that gets in the way of Jesus and the centrality of Jesus and what Jesus accomplished. I mean, you think of Mary, you think of the saints, you think of all these things that, that I think have appeal because it seems to give you more touch points with God and with grace in a way. But but you, it, it's so far removed from actually going to the source of all this grace with who is Christ. It, it's just, I, I, I'm not sure still why people would, um, would, would go there except with some notion that, you know, a common, a common cliche is this is the church that Jesus founded. And so, you know, if you have that idea that Roman Catholicism and all this stuff that comes with it is what Jesus intended, okay, then I guess, you know, you're trying to be a faithful Christian and that's a good motive, but it's really hard to back that stuff up Mm -hmm. either from scripture or even tradition. I mean, I think the tradition itself can get a little dodgy when it comes to a lot of the uh, accretions that have come along Roman Catholicism throughout its, its long history. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring up Machen and we think especially about his perhaps most well-known book, Christianity and Liberalism. And it's said time and time again, but it bears worth repeating that basically the thesis is built into that book where you don't have liberalism as a species of or a different form of Christianity, but true liberalism, classic liberalism, is a different religion altogether. Um, That brings me back to to speak about Catholicism and and how large and how broad it is. And you do find people, you you will find, you know, genuine believers within the Catholic Church. As you say, it's not advisable. We don't think that's necessarily good for your soul, especially week to week. But um, it's possible uh, but it's also a definite case that in, in the Catholic Church, there are large swaths of it that are as bad, if not worse, than classic liberalism uh, of a Protestant variety. I'm reminded of that book, and you mention it in your book here, um, you know, Is the Reformation Over by uh, Noel and, and Nystrom. And it, I believe, at least in terms of mainline Protestantism and uh, just what I find as, as dominant post-Vatican II theology and Catholicism— for the most part, the Reformation is over uh, for those groups. Uh, they, right, right. They could practically, other than a few maybe administrative things, they could just merge today and be happy with it, you know, with a, a post-Kantian theology, and, and they could go, go all in and find some way to actualize in their philosophy some new meld, you know? God is still speaking, and now he says we should join together and heal the wounds, the 500-year-old wounds. I mean, they, they can find a way, and maybe one day that'll happen for political or financial reasons. But, right. Um, well, you know, it's it, also interesting, though, that, that, that one of the varieties of Roman Catholicism 
the conservatives or traditionalists, depending on which group, but, but they'll look at the kind of liberalization of the teaching offices of the church since Vatican II, and you find those, those conservative Roman Catholics making a move similar to what evangelicals or conservatives in the PCUSA used to say about the church, which is, well, and even John Gerstner had said this, well, the creeds haven't changed. You know, the team, well, yes and no. The, the, until, <laughs> until they re, until they revise the confession, yeah, those things haven't changed. And so there's there's almost like this kind of doctrinal logocentric understanding of Roman Catholicism, which yeah. I think actually Protestants take with them into the church because I think cradle Roman Catholics are much more sacramental than they are oh, for theological, sure. yeah, in, in their understanding of the faith. But there is this kind of wiggle room that you can say, well. I can go back to these documents. Those documents are still there, so that's what Roman Catholicism means, no matter what the crazy theo- theology professor at, at Notre Dame teaches, or no matter how much his superior should be you know, reining him in. No, I've still got this truth over here. And again, it's similar to what, what um, conservatives who stayed in the mainline churches it's true. did for a while. Yeah, well, you know, let's jump there for a moment. We'll come, we can backtrack a little bit, but, you know, the second to last and the third to last— uh, chapters here of the book are, is Protestantism responsible for modernity? And then secondly, what if at Vatican II, Rome abandoned being the church Jesus founded? And those are definitely questions uh, that are on point for this issue. And that's something that was perhaps most striking to me, studying Vatican II theology. And I don't want to bang a drum. I've been banging for for years, but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I People need to know this. And again, when I'm not, when I say this, speaking for all of Catholicism, I can't. But I can say that there's a significant portion of, of Catholicism that is very much in line with the theology of Karl Rahner. And Karl Rahner would say, he'd look at something like the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, and he would say that is inspired, inerrant, infallible theology, you know, given by God through the magisterium. That is tradition. That is still binding. It's infallible. But at the same time, we need a new Christology for an evolutionary view of the world. So mm. he can, it's always both and with the post-Vatican II theology. They can say, well, this is infallible teaching, but it, it, you know, for me to simplify this, maybe at the risk of oversimplifying it, but it's basically taking a truth from the Kant's noumenal realm, and then the magisterium instantiates it or actualizes it or just applies it to a, a, an historical circumstance. And so you could say that Chalcedon is infallible for 451, and it and it has a lot that we can learn from today, but it may or may not be entirely applicable to the church in its current circumstances. And so the church theoretically could come up with new declaration that is also infallible, but may, in fact, be somewhat contradictory to previous infallible declarations, because the line always has to be drawn vertically. You can't draw horizontal lines. Now, this is very different from like Newman's understanding of a development of doctrine, but it Mm. still opens up the possibility for Rome to have a legitimate change without denying anything that they've said in the past. I, you know, that's, and, and that's something they can't do before Kant, right? I mean, that's no, kind of, right. that's kind of a modern dialectic, isn't well, it? Well, unless you're like some sort of hyper Platonist, I suppose, you know, I don't know, you know, there's some, some sort of doctrinal plenum out there, <laughs> but, uh-huh. yep. but you're right. It, it's very much, and, and that's why I brought it up in the first place, because it's very akin to a theology of revelation you might find in liberalism. Right, and, and it's, I mean, it, it is important to remember, too, that Pius X, the Pope beginning of the 20th century, condemned modernism and was condemning philosophical trends that oh, yeah. you could argue were, were leading it in this direction, though full-blown resourcement theology may not have, have emerged quite yet. But, I mean, so, so Rome, up until you know, 1950. Right. They had an anti-modernist oath. Very, right. I every mean, priest, a, every person had to subscribe to the, every person with an office had to subscribe to an anti-modernist oath that you rejected modernism, but then it snuck right in at Vatican II. 
just under a different right. different name. And I mean, it, it gets particularly um, it's, it's it's serious because on the books in the catechism and different teaching points in the history of Roman Catholicism, the laity are expected to assent to the truths taught by the church. So, and if you don't assent to them, you are, I think, in danger of mortal sin. And if you're in danger of mortal sin, then you're, you're in danger of going to hell, not just purgatory, but hell. And, and so this isn't, you know, it's, it's not a theology seminar where we, we can kind of come out of it and think, wow, those are some interesting ideas and we might want to write a paper a little bit differently now. No, but the destinies of souls are at stake in this, yes. according at least to parts of Rome's history of teaching about salvation and the importance of belonging to the Church and assenting and, and o- obeying or, or following the teaching of the Church. I mean— you know, an older view was it was a very strict strict church, and you could get yourself in some serious trouble. Um, you know, whether bishops enforced that all the time in this world is one thing, but there was still the threat of the world to come. And again, it seems to me that maybe part of the crisis that the church is facing right now with the sexual scandals is that loss of a sense of sin and its eternal consequences. I mean, I do, not that you want to have people be good out of a sense of threat, but, but I mean, I think there was probably a lot more um, worry about breaking the law, breaking God's law, worry about sin in an older time when the church was a lot stricter and seemingly a lot clearer about what the church taught and what the mechanisms of authority were. And again, you know, Vatican II may not have opened the door. Maybe the door was already opening and Vatican II just recognized it. But still, it it is a a major uh, change in the church. And I think it makes, in some ways, it makes it easier for Protestants to convert because it doesn't seem to be like you have to give up as much as maybe you once had to. Um, because it's a it's a much more encompassing, welcoming, in- inclusive sort of church now. But you still have that 1,900 years of teaching before that, which yeah. I don't. You know, I, I would. I mean, one of the one of the people I follow on Twitter, and I, and I read as much as I can. A guy who writes for National Review, Michael Brendan Do- Doherty. Um, very, I think he's a traditionalist Roman Catholic, and. I heard, a, heard him do an interview, and, and to his credit, he says he's particularly concerned when he's going to fly somewhere that he kind of you know ups his game of holiness before the flight because he doesn't want to die in a plane accident and, oh, and, before and, and recognize that he's, he's committed mortal sin. Oh. I mean, you know, and yeah, you do empathize for somebody like that, but at least he's sort of taking that side of Roman Catholicism seriously which it seems to me is what you really should do if, if, if the consequences of sin are what they are and you need as much grace and all these outlets for grace that Rome provides. Yeah. You know, there's, there's so much in the book we're not going to get to uh, today, but I, I mean, people are going to really need to read this. Um, there's, there's great history on uh, why the Reformation happened as well as uh, individual chapters on Sola Scriptura and the Gospel, the, the, the Reformation is particularly of the doctrine of justification. And we need to know those things, and, and we never graduate from those aspects. So it's always helpful to rehearse those and then understand how they continue to apply uh, to the, the debate and interaction between Protestants and Catholics today. But Daryl, I wanted to ask you, uh, at, at least at this juncture, uh, just about some of the other bigger differences uh, between Protestants and Catholics that that people might not consider, uh, you know, in terms of it might not seem to address them day to day, week to week, but not only church government, but also just the understanding of, of vocation and spirituality. Uh, why is it important to to understand that there are Protestant and you know there are differences between Protestants and Catholics upon these things, and they're not necessarily just arbitrary choices that one can make for aesthetic reasons? Um, well, vocation is um, 
something I think even Protestants have uh, neglected. I mean, we sort of have it in the background and we trot it out on occasion. But um, I, I, in writing a little piece, not only this chapter here, but something for New Horizons on vocation for the series on the Reformation, I, I did a little more reading in it and um, was struck by how wide the difference was between the Reformers and the medieval church on the dignity and the value of work in the so-called secular world and even ordinary work like, you know, baking and changing diapers. You know, you can find famous quotations from Luther about this that really are, are wonderful. But the idea that that work is um, and, and attending to the responsibilities given to us providentially you know, I mean, it's not as if God somehow comes to you or me and says, you're going to be this uh, <laughs> right. when it, it comes to being a father or a husband or something. I mean, mm-hmm. these are things that just sort of come along with the package of, of being a human being and taking on responsibilities. But in those various um, responsibilities, which are part of God's providential care for his creation, it does seem to me that these are also kind of sanctifying things. I know it's a cliche to say that you know, idle hands are the devil's business, whatever that, that uh, adage is. But work does keep us out of a lot of <laughs> potentially bad things. And, and, and then Protestants came along and, and said, these are ways that we can both love our neighbor, care for those around us. Those are, you know, whatever service we're kind of doing, depending on our occupation. But these are also ways that we can glorify God. And I think it's been sometimes an abstraction to think that in my work, whether it's teaching or writing or something that I glorify God, it's like, yeah, well, wouldn't that be greater? That's an, I mean, that almost seems like it's a kind of, um, could facilitate pride. Oh, my work is so great that it glorifies God or something. But (laughs) I think it's more on the order of, again, it glorifies God in the sense that it's part of his, part of his creation, part of his providential care, part of the variety of the ways in which he sustains his people, not just the redeemed, but also unsaved, that God is a, is a God who, who gives us all these good gifts so that we can provide for each other. And that really does um, bespeak uh, the goodness and greatness of God in, in doing that. And so uh, anyway, I think that that understanding of work and the workplace the marketplace, et cetera, was was very much missing in Roman Catholicism up until, um, well, I mean, I, I think you could argue it was missing pretty much up until maybe even the 20th century when the laity in the Roman Catholic Church, especially, for instance, in the United States, were so often an immigrant church and there wasn't the kind of thinking about work and its value and meaning. It was much more hand to fist, but I think once uh, professionalization hit and the church began to reflect on some of these matters, then they tried to come round to a doctrine of vocation for secular callings, but still, officially, the language of vocation in Roman Catholicism is reserved for priests in the religious orders, Um, which again, it goes back to major differences between Protestants and Roman Catholics in the 16th century, and again, what we do in our callings in order to gain salvation. I mean, I've been, I have met younger um, people. I think it's mainly women, but maybe some men too have, who have gone either into mon- monasteries or convents. And typically what they oftentimes are doing, this is a way to save yourself. You go yep. there to seek salvation and, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound um, crude about it, but that almost seems a little selfish. Well, you, they used to send to your, your you kids to the monastery for the same reason, right? Hopefully right, they can build up some merit you for can't, you. You can't seek that same salvation out here in yeah. an other, you know, even teaching students in a public school or, or, you know, I mean, being a veterinarian or something, those, those aren't worthwhile lines of work where you could you, where you could seek salvation, you know, participate in the life of a parish, par- partake of the sacraments, go to confession, all these things. Why isn't, you know, that isn't good enough, but there's still this kind of hierarchy of spiritual 
rankings in Rome that even, you know, one of the, the way I end the book is, has to do with how saints, how you become a saint right. in mm-hmm. Roman Catholicism. I, I base that a lot on a fascinating book by Ken Woodward, longtime a reporter for Newsweek on religious matters, himself a Roman Catholic, though probably of a more liberal sort. And, I mean, he goes in, <laughs> into the sausage-making aspects of, of sainthood. And it's again, it's just staggering. And he's doing that to try to explain it to outsiders. He's not doing it as an expose. He's not doing it to criticize his own church. But he's also fairly matter of fact about it and saying there are some problems in the way this has evolved and happened over time. And, and to think that instead, Paul, well, all the apostles in in, in the letters of, of the New Testament address all Christians as saints. There's no we're all saints or, or, or we're not. I mean, you know, you're either a saint if you're in the church or you're not. And for Roman Catholics, you don't know if you're going to be a saint. I mean, it, this is something that is going to be decided in some ways after after your life. And again, it it, it points to that hierarchy in the church, that uncertainty of salvation. And, and as Jim was saying earlier, that, that way of sort of living living by the law or trying to follow the law and gaining salvation in that way. Of course, it's always grace assisted, grace infused. Roman Catholics do not talk about works apart from grace. You know, I think that's one of the cliches that Protestants have or, or caricatures of Rome that Protestants have, that this is a works based based faith as if, as if grace is uh, not a part of it. It's always, grace is always much a part of it, but certainly gets into levels of cooperation and it's still something that you need to kind of do and, and cultivate and help along. And if you do it really well, then maybe you can be a saint. Right. Right. You know, what's, um, really remarkable, just going back to the discussion about vocation, uh, what I've noticed in, in my pastoral ministry as people have come into the Reformed Church from outside of the Reformed faith, but still in Protestantism, coming from a broadly evangelical background, is that they come in oftentimes with very much of a, a similar view of vocation, that true vocation, real spiritual vocation, is is what the pastor does. Then if you're not a pastor, well, maybe you settle for being an elder or a deacon. And if you can't quite match up to that level, well, then maybe you could do a mission trip here or, or here or there. Um, but unless you are doing a mission trip or you are somehow actively involved in, in ministry, you are not at all involved in a holy calling. You have just a kind of a secular um, uh, occupation and a secular view that's really, at the end of the day, quite meaningless and insignificant. And um, that's, you get a lot of, in evangelicals like that to whom I, I minister, you get a lot of kind of guilt that, that, and, 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 and this kind of hang up with um, going to work working well, working hard, and gee, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do any missions this year. I couldn't go on a mission trip. I couldn't, I couldn't go out to the park and do evangelism. I couldn't do this, that, or the other thing because I was busy, you know, working. And, um, and I've had opportunities to turn to, to people, uh, to brothers and sisters like that and say, you know what, you were doing ministry when, when you went and you worked at, your job, uh, at the jail working 60 hours that week, or as you were, uh, doing, going to, to teach at the public school or whatnot, um, that, that wasn't not ministry. That's you doing your ministry to which God has called you. Mm. And, um, I find that kind of in the reform world, uh, or at least reform or Calvinistic in the broadest sense of the word, where Protestantism kind of gets reduced to just the five, um, kind of solas of the Reformation. Um, what I appreciate about this book uh, so much, and, and that chapter in particular on vocation, is to realize that that being a Protestant includes a lot more than the five solas, as important, significant as that is. Um, but when we don't kind of broaden that out and take the full sweeping um, uh, Reformation that that occurred in in the 16th century and and beyond. Um, we, we really lose a lot and, and, and we're in danger, even, even evangelicals, even Protestants are in danger of kind of falling back into Romish type 
mentalities and practices, even if it's unwitting. Right. And a great illustration of this. I mean, it, it, it comes with all sorts of trigger warnings attached, but the, the movie, the big kahuna, which I've written yeah. about in, in, a, um, and again, it's a, so Kevin Spacey's in it. So there you go. Yeah. Stay away from that. But also there's a lot of foul language in it, but, uh, it's about, if you can get past that, it's about this evangelical who's working on a sales team going to a convention, and they're trying to land the big account with the big kahuna uh, for indu- selling industrial lubricants. And the evangelical kid who's portrayed really well, really uh, em- empathetically, um, but he, instead of trying to get the deal done, he meets the owner of this company that tr- they're trying to sell to. And he starts to talk to him about religion, about Jesus. And, and, it, and Kevin Spacey, the character he plays, just goes nuts. You know, what are you doing? We're here, to, we're here to make money. You know, and so that tension is there even in something like this movie. But, but again, what I like about the movie is that it portrays this evangelical very uh, humanely. It, it, it's not trying to take a cheap shot at him, but it shows the dilemma that Protestants themselves can suffer by not recognizing uh, a fuller doctrine of vocation. I think uh, Jim lost his comma in Ephesians four <laughs> twelve. Well, I'm still holding on to the comma, but I'm actually Amy Bird. I, I hold on to the comma about. too. I'm just teasing Jim. Uh, anyway, no, but Amy Amy, Amy Amy Bird, um, her book Every No Little Women. Um, I. I taught through that in Sunday school at our congregation, not just for women, but for men to try to be discerning theologically. And I, and I, I did think more about vocation in the context, too, that the kind of um, lowercase m ministry, I still want to reserve holy office for yeah, sure. the ministry of word and sacrament. And, and and elders and deacons, that you have to be set apart for these things. But the work that parents do with children is enormously important to passing on the faith. The work that spouses do with each other in a Christian home is also incredibly important. And then the work that friends do with each other. I mean, th- there are people that I'm sure you guys can talk to uh, who are your Christian friends that you can you know, gain some wisdom, guidance, uh, perspective on things. And, and these aren't necessarily just going to our pastors. I don't think we have to go to pastors for Roman Catholics to priests just for this, that, that God has equipped all sorts of people around us with insights, even if it's not into the Bible, that may be just about the nature of human existence that help us get through uh, and again, it's part of God's good gift to His 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 creation that we have these kinds of relationships. So anyway, you know, I want I still want to reserve um, office and and the uniqueness of it, but also recognize yeah. how much in the body of Christ, ordinary Christians contribute to the well-being of other believers. Yeah, and it, it also just um, you know in terms of. Uh, understanding all labor to which Christians are called, uh, they are called to be servants of one another, right? And, and so in the, in the broadest sense of the word, we can speak about, um, you know, the ministry of each believer. And I also hold the comment in, in uh, Ephesians 4 as well. But, um, you know, but I think that that's something that we, we, we missed today, that back in a previous day, um, uh, was uh, not missed. Uh, you think about the the old uh, seals that you would find on the side of police cars, uh, where it said to protect and serve. Right. It, it, the idea of being uh, a public servant is something that is kind of missing today. Um, right. Where you know we are we are called whether you're in the ministry or not. Um, we are called to be servants of one another. And um, and that that applies, you know, in the most general sense to all believers, um, <clears throat> while at the same time reserving the special office. But I I had a I had a question about um, uh, chapter four. Well, maybe it's more of a of a lead in than anything else, um, because the the chapter on on church government uh, is again I think something that is so important 
especially kind of just running parallel with what we're saying about vocation. A lot of people, a lot of evangelicals come, they call themselves Calvinists. Uh, you know, they, they affirm predestination or something like that. Um, and then kind of don't give much thought to the issue of church government. Uh, why, Daryl, is, is church government, and particularly at the time of the Reformation, uh, an important and significant matter? Well, I mean, it, it, in part, it has to do with um, power, authority, and at the time of the Reformation, um, you know, there, there are only two options that you have if you're going to appeal that Luther can, can to whom Luther can appeal. He can appeal to the emperor. He can appeal to the pope. Um, and uh, in, in if if there's if there aren't other ways of uh, sort of having checks and balances in church government, um, and it's really that the episcopacy ri- relies upon the rulings of one person, not either the local. Archbishop or or the the Pope all the way to the top. I mean, so um, it, it really was a hard thing for Protestants to try to try to make some reform. That's even the case now. A lot of lay Roman Catholics are sending letters, petitions to bishops to clean up their act. But uh, one bishop, like maybe I'm not sure where he stands in the U.S. Um, uh, what are they called? The Council for the U.S. Bishops um, says that they'll try to work on this as much as they can, but they're still dependent on Vatican approval for whatever they're going to do. It's it's really a difficult thing when you think about Roman Catholicism, whether in the 16th century or now, to try to reform the church simply on the basis of what the bishops are willing to do. There's a lot of vested interest that these men have just as Congress has a lot of vested interest in trying to reform itself to change their ways. And so, um, you know, Protestants, magisterial Protestants wound up appealing to princes or kings to get things done, and they became state churches as a result. Um, But, you know, the genius of, seems to me, of Reformed Protestantism is when Calvin comes along and writes the ecclesiastical ordinances and figures out a way for church government to be to be done by councils or by assemblies or by presbyteries and, and synods. Um, there is a there is a tr- there's a tradition in the Western Church even before the Reformation of conciliarism, the great crisis, the great schism in the church in the late. 14th and into the 15th centuries, when there was the Avignon papacy, the papacy in Rome, there was a great papal crisis. How are you going to get one pope back when you already have two rival popes? And there was a time when the Council of Constance, if I'm remembering correctly, correctly, actually appoints another pope to, to remedy the situation, but it means for a brief time you have three popes. And so some people wanted the councils to have more standing in controlling the church, and they had an agreement with the pope that they appointed, I think it was Martin V, to say that, no, you're going to call councils now every 10 years. Well, that sort of went by the board. Calvin's genius, although as clerk of session, I I wish we didn't have to meet monthly, but Calvin's genius is to regularize regularize these meetings of church officers so that session yeah. meets once a month, presbyteries meet three or four times a year, general assemblies meet once a year. Um, you know, for some people it's three, you know, every three years a synod meets or something. But but we have so much oversight by so many officers on the ground that Rome doesn't have in the Episcopal system. This would also apply to Anglicanism as well, the Episcopal system there. So one of the great... Um, seems to me achievements of Protestantism is to really think about the dangers of that kind of Episcopal system. It it should come naturally to Americans because we have an anti-monarchical strand to us. We, we rebelled against a King. Um, okay. We also rebelled against the parliament, but, um, but Americans just don't have as much of a regard for monarchy the way maybe Canadians do, although we have the crown and we have getting up early in the morning to see royal weddings and whatnot. Um, 
but but so anyway, Protestants sort of fall much more on the side of rule by the few or rule by the many. Congregationalism would be ruled by the many. Mm. Uh, Presbyterianism would be ruled by the few. For Roman Catholics and Anglicans, it's ruled by the one. It's kind of a monarchical system. And there's a real, you know, the crisis of politics in the 18th century for France and America was a crisis of uh, divine right monarchy, that these people had too much power. But that's still the case for Rome. You could argue that the Pope and the Vatican still have incredible power over the church. Whether they use it or not is another matter. Yeah. You know, I'm doing this all backwards today, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to perhaps just to, to try to, in, in closing, before I lose my opportunity to bring it up, but Mether, John Mether in the, in the foreword, uh, I, you know, looking upon and assessing your book as a whole, says that Protestantism apparently has a beauty, an intellectual, and a unity deficit. And that's something that you spend a majority of the book, you know, addressing, you know, what, what is the actual status of the Catholic Church and what is Protestantism in relation to it? Is there truly a beauty and an intellectual and a unity deficit? But I'm interested in something you said, you know, about an hour ago, right as we started to, to speak, because you're, you're very concerned about the number of people that have converted from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism, but also you you mentioned how that that you you were wondering about that, but also how you're you're considering why Catholicism does not have such an appeal uh, to you. Um, what is it about maybe your history or your personal experience <laughs> and your assessment of Rome where you might you might see things differently, or maybe you've been given a window behind the curtain, as it were, where other people identify a beauty and intellectual and a unity deficit you've you've really i don't know deconstructed protestantism and come to, <laughs> come to understood it much better i'm curious about that do you have any thoughts yeah well i haven't thought about it a whole lot i mean i i think having grown up in a um fundamentalist baptist church you could probably do the numbers and say well there's no way this guy was ever going to do it but i mean i've I had one of my uh, good friends from a former job who converted had grown up a um, an Anabaptist on oh, a farm yeah, in Indiana. Right. So I mean, how does that work? Exactly. Um, it's I don't think you can predict these things these things simply by demographics. Um, but something I guess my parents did instill in me was a uh, high regard for the Bible. Um, I even won two. Schofield reference Bibles as a kid. Now, thankfully, I don't use. <laughs> Do they cancel Schofield each other out? <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I guess it's it's the um, it's the centrality of the word for Protestants, which I, again can be a cliche and can be something we take for granted. Uh, I have to say, in in the congregation here in Hillsdale, while I was writing this book, uh, um, we have long readings from Old and New Testament every service, and, and I've come to understand the Bible better than I ever did in the course of just ordinary worship here, not to mention family worship, etc. But um, but I, I, I think that's a big part of it. And then, as I said earlier, so a high regard for the Bible, and Protestants are known for that. I mean, I think I try to impress this sometimes upon students who talk to me about um, converting to Rome, um, I try I try not to play spiritual counselor on campus. I try to keep my professional life professional. Um, but you know, they say, "Why? What should I look for in a church?" And I say, "Well, where do you where do you hear the most Bible? Where do you hear the most exposition of the Word? The, if this is truly the Word of God, if this is divine revelation, that's huge. I mean, that's a big deal. It's not just a really good book like Shakespeare or, you know." Uh, Chaucer or or Dickens, you know, it's it's not just great literature. This no, this is the very word of God in some way. That's that's astounding. Then on, on top of that, I think um, my recognition of my sinfulness and the need for a savior who paid for all my sins, namely Jesus, also makes me think that there's something wrong with a Christian communion that gives me, that elevates Mary and the saints into the roles that they play. 
I mean, I want to go straight to Jesus. The uh, the Great Commission publication, uh, Sunday School series, Show Me Jesus. Now, we don't want to do that literally. We don't want images of Jesus, thank you. <laughs> right. but, yeah. but, but take me straight to Jesus. It seems to me that is medicine for my sick soul. And I just feel like I'd have to wade through way too much to finally get to Jesus in the Roman Catholic Church. You'd be wading through a lot of beautiful art. I get that. It is beautiful. Um, but still, that's not, that's, that's not going to save me. I, I mean, I need, I need Christ and his mediation only. Um, and so that for me, it's, in that sense, it's, it's a personal question with regard to my own uh, hope for salvation. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You know, that's, that's so helpful that these are, these are things that really matter. And um, yep. the question is, you know, what has God said and what has he given us uh, as a means of grace and how are we to know him better? And and uh, we pray that people would really think about these things, contemplate them, and, and they'd be convicted of them. And then they would that they would seek out a communion that is faithful uh, to God's word. Uh, but I, I trust that if people read this, that they're going to come away with a, with a deeper and better understanding of these things. Yeah, I, I just add one point to, to what you just said and what I was saying, too, that I know the book will come up short uh, in, in convincing someone who ha- is, is really thinking about becoming Roman Catholic. There's like a tipping point that I've, I think I've discerned with some people that once, once they get to that point, arguments aren't going to bring them back. And, and I've had enough exchanges online and with people in person that it really is hard to convince. You get into a kind of intellectual gymnastics as far as, oh, well, you're inc- inconsistent here. You said papal infallibility here, but you didn't apply it over here. You know, you can do these kinds of games. And, and in that sense, the book isn't really going to, to settle those kinds of debates. I think to try to point out where some of the debates are and what some of the questions are is is useful to the book. But I think, again, the way I end the book, but also in covering the Reformation the way I tried to, the first half of the book, um, what really is important is salvation. How do, you, Where are you going to wind up? And this is why I do try to prod students who are thinking about converting. I mean, if if I have the conversation, and again, I don't try to have these on campus, but if they come up in a church setting, I will. It's, it's like to say, look at you are going to heaven now with your current understanding of salvation as a Protestant. You're going to heaven. You become Roman Catholic. The best you have is going to purgatory. The best. If you really worry about mortal sin and you die in mortal sin without having gotten to confession, you could be going to hell. Now, how can you possibly exchange that? I mean, that's very self-interested. I know it's not, it's not a theocentric understanding or a Christocentric understanding of, of salvation. But still, it does seem to me that you go from something that is incredibly um, encouraging and hopeful that you will go to mm. be with God as opposed to uh, you're not really sure. Yeah. What you're going to wind up with. You don't know how your life is going to turn out. Sure. Um, I, I, don't, I don't mean to trouble people with that uncertainty, although I sort of do. But but I mean, that's the kind of issue, it seems to me, that's, that's at stake in these questions. So it, again, it is, to build on what you said, it is a very personal matter. Yeah. And, and it, important. It, it, it is personal and important. But uh, yeah, we, by by the use of church tradition— much of the Catholic tradition has made the good news not so great anymore. <laughs> right. And, and we always need to, to hear God's word, and we need to exalt the Lord, and, and we need to uphold him and his word as, as he's revealed it to us. So there are a lot of other theological issues at stake. We could have those conversations on another day in terms of the relationship of uh, of the word to tradition. You talk about some of that in the book, but... Overall, I think this is a very strong book. I think people, I think it's much needed. I'm glad you wrote it, and I, I hope people will pick it up. It's still protesting uh, why the Reformation matters, 
But if I could give a loving sub subtitle, I'd call it, uh, it's your companion piece. I'd call it deconstructing, deconstructing Catholicism. So we have a deconstructing evangelicalism, now a deconstructing Catholicism. <laughs> anyway. I'll take it. Yeah. It, 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 I don't work for RHB, so I had no input, but that's what we're going with. Anyway, Daryl, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for taking time out of your day, especially this kind of busy transitional time in the school year, but we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Good to talk to you and, and you too, Jim. Well, let me uh, point people online. You can head over to oldlife.org. That's one of uh, Daryl's website, uh, websites. You can also visit uh, patheos.com slash blogs slash slash protest protest. So if you haven't had enough protest, you can have a double shot just in the URL. Um, and uh, you can also uh, find out more information about Hillsdale College at hillsdale.edu, a great school there, and uh, about uh, Hillsdale OP as well. You can search and find out information online, and Everett Hennis, who, who, to whom the book was, was uh, dedicated. And uh, we're online as well at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about all of our programs as well as how to subscribe to them and, and get in touch with us. But I want to thank everybody for listening. I hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.